The dugout was stocked with a week's worth of canned food, water, a radio, flashlights, and batteries. We never had to use more than the radio and the flashlight in all these years of occasional tornado warnings. Until this particular tornado, that is. About five minutes after we were settled into the dugout, the wind started picking up outside. We could hear thunder and rain outside the door as we started hearing the splats and bangs of what was probably large hail hitting the metal dugout door. The sound of the wind changed to a roar, similar to a plane about to take off. We could hear the different sounds of objects hitting the door, but then we heard a loud crack and a lot of scraping on the door. In total, the entire event lasted maybe seven minutes, but we didn't try to leave the dugout until the wind died down. My husband unbarred the door and tried opening it, but it would only open about an inch. We could see through the crack that the apple tree next to the dugout had blown over in front of the door. We tried to pry the door open every which way, slamming our bodies against the door. Nothing worked. We were stuck in the shelter. We knew at some point there would be people checking on places in the tornado's path, so we stuck a flip-flop in the crack of the door to hold it open and got comfortable, prepared to wait. We entered the dugout about 2 p.m. By 4 p.m. we discovered that my husband never thought about the necessity of entertainment, especially with kids in an enclosed space. By 5 p.m. we discovered that my husband never thought about latrine logistics for when you were trapped in a shelter. When 7 p.m. rolled around, we discovered that claustrophobia and panic attacks can strike anyone no matter how prepared you are. We were safe, we were prepared physically for a week, but I'm not sure our minds could have lasted a week. We could see it was dark through the crack of the door when a foul odor wafted in. It smelled like a wet dog combined with a male goat and teenager armpits. I thought it was an overly pungent skunk, and I went to shut the door, but I stopped when I heard what sounded like footsteps. We started yelling for help, calling out to whoever was out there, but nobody responded. There was a shuffling sound, and the smell got even stronger. My eyes were watering as I yelled out, pounding on the door, and I heard a grunt before the sound of footsteps and smell started fading away. The kids asked why the person didn't help us. I didn't know, but I told them that maybe they were going for extra help. It didn't explain why the person didn't at least talk to us. Thirty minutes passed, and the smell and footsteps returned. We yelled and pounded on the door, and again, no response, and the footsteps and smell faded away again. This time I felt uneasy and I barred the door shut. Two times this person came and ignored our calls for help. Something wasn't right with this person. The kids and my husband fell asleep, and I kept an ear out for rescuers for a few hours. Around 3 in the morning, my daughter woke up from a nightmare and started crying. I was comforting her when I heard branches cracking and scraping against the door, along with grunting. I woke my husband up and we pounded on the door, yelling. We could smell that odor again, so we left the door barred, just in case. When the noises outside stopped, we waited about 10 minutes to try and open the door. This time, the door opened enough for us to step out. The trunk of the tree was still laying near the door, but there was a pile of branches off to the side. There were a lot of footprints, but they were bigger than any foot I had ever seen. We woke our son up and we all left the dugout, heading towards the house. It was still dark, but we could see that for the most part, the tornado didn't do much damage. There was the tree down by the shelter, and a few fences that looked damaged. After we checked the house, I headed out to the barn to see if the animals were okay. I was about halfway there when I heard one of our meat hogs screaming. The same sound they make when you trap one. I ran towards the barn and stopped a few yards away. I could see my market-ready Hampshire Barrow struggling and screaming while slung over the shoulder of a dark, hulking, human-like figure. I yelled at the figure to drop my pig, and it just turned and looked at me. I shined my flashlight at the creature's face. It had a grayish face with a flat-looking nose. It had thin, dark brown hair all over its body and massive feet. After a few seconds, it turned and walked into our cornfield towards the creek and disappeared from my view. I've seen Finding Bigfoot, so I know what I was looking at. I know it was a Bigfoot. I talked to my mom and she said she'd seen the wild people when she was a kid. My great-great-grandpa had installed the metal door on the dugout after hearing stories of wild people in the area, but the only trouble they seemed to cause was stealing livestock, like what I had seen. We have had animals seemingly disappear into thin air over the years, and it makes sense now. With how big that creature was, it could easily take far more and cause a lot more damage. 
It also could have left us in the shelter and taken as many of our animals as it wanted, but it probably just took what it needed. Considering that we didn't see anyone physically show up to check on us for two days after the tornado, and we were losing our minds in there, I'm not angry about it taking a pig as payment. 